Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Meeple University. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Coffee Traders. Coming up. Let's learn to play Coffee Traders. Game designed by Rolf Sargel and Andre Spiel and published by Capstone Games. If you find value from this video later, please hit the like button, subscribe to us, hit the bell and leave your feedback in the comments for others to find. For now, let's get to the table. Coffee Traders is a game about the fair trade coffee industry around the world. Three to five players play the role of fair trade coffee companies. They will work to increase the quality of five different fair trade cooperatives around the world, building new plantations and buildings, earning points for how much they improve a specific cooperative as opposed to their opponents. And separately, they'll trade with those same cooperatives. They don't have to trade with cooperatives that they've had any part in building up, but they can trade where it will earn them the most valuable coffee to complete their contracts. The player who earns the most points from building cooperatives and trading in coffee over three rounds of play will win the game. I won't step you through the game's rather extensive setup, but I will introduce you to the components, tracks, and where your points are going to come from. Here in the center of the board are the five main coffee cooperatives in Brazil, Guatemala, Indonesia, Ethiopia, and Colombia. Each produces a different type of Arabica coffee. These sections here are where plantations will be built, and these sections here represent where buildings can be built. This circle is the town center, and this is where workers will stand before they go to work on the plantations. Each co-op also has its associated trading house in Antwerp. There is also a small cooperative in Sumatra. This produces a sixth type of coffee called Kopi Luwak, which are the beans which have been pre-digested by civet cats. This is different to the five Arabica varieties in the game. On the right of the board is the five Arabica tracks, and each player will be advancing on these, with one corresponding to each of the Arabica co-ops. There are bonuses and victory points available for advancements on these tracks. At the top left of the board are the coffee bars, which contain common coffee orders which players will be competing to fulfil. At the bottom left of the board are three milestones, and players who are first, second or third to complete these will gain points. Then each player has a player board, which looks like this. On the left, you'll see all of the plantations and buildings that the player has available to build. On the right is your warehouse, where all the coffee you gain during the game will be stored. You begin the game with six personal contracts, and through the game you'll be trying to fulfill these for bonuses and points. And on the right hand side of the board is a track where you'll be placing tokens through the game, eventually gaining points based on how high you place them. Near the top of your board on the left are all of the resources available to your company. So you've got your action cubes and meeples, all of the money, donkeys and other resources owned by your company, and workers available to your company. Everything else in the game, whether it's in your colour or in neutral colours, belongs to the general supply, and you should keep these aside to avoid confusing them with your company supply. These coffee beans are not resources, they're player markers which mark the contracts and milestones which you've completed. The game is played in three rounds, and each round is played in six phases, with a turn order track shown on the board. These six phases are marked out from left to right across your player board. First is the work phase, and here players will take action specifically to build up the plantation section of the five co-ops, which includes building new plantations and distributing workers onto those plantations. Second is the workers phase, which provides a slightly different opportunity for players to put workers onto plantations. A cooperative will only produce coffee from all of its manned plantations. Third is traders and contractors, and here players will take two different types of actions. Firstly, constructing buildings onto the cooperatives, and to position themselves for trade. Fourth is harvest, where each cooperative produces coffee, which is distributed to those who trade with it, with any coffee gain being added to the players' warehouses. 
Fifth is the contract phase, where players spend coffee in order to complete their private contracts and complete coffee bar contracts on the main board. And finally, the refresh phase, where players discard any coffee that won't fit in their warehouses, gain coffee for stocks, and set up for the next round. Before we talk about each phase individually, we need to talk about action cubes, action meeples, and the bonus supply box which links them together. In the work phase, each action requires you to spend one or more action cubes in order to take the action. Each player has three black action cubes, and in the four player game only, one additional action cube in player colour. At the end of a round, you'll get all of these action cubes back, except for the coloured one in a four player game. This can only be used once per game. As such, across three rounds, you'll have nine action cubes to use in a three or five player game, and ten in a four player game. In the traders and contractors phase, each action you take requires you to spend one of your trader or contractor meeples. You begin with three of these in a four or five player game, and four in a three player game, and can gain more during the game up to a maximum of five. As was the case for the action cubes, you'll gain all of these back at the end of each round, ready for use next round. Each player also has a section called the bonus supply, containing one black cube, one trader contractor meeple, and three coins. These can be freely used at any time, with two restrictions. Firstly, if you take the coins from the bonus supply, you must take all three of the coins at once, moving them to your company supply. And secondly, the bonus supply box can never be empty, so you can't take all three bonuses in the same round. You can only take a maximum of two. In the refresh phase, at the end of each round, you refill the bonus box. Action cubes and meeples are returned from those that you played, while money has to be paid back from the money you earned that round. Think of it as a loan. So, what are the implications of this? Essentially, it means that if you never take the loan option, you'll always have one additional action cube and one additional action meeple for free in each round. But if you choose to take the loan option in any round, then you can only take one of the two bonus actions. It's also permissible to refill the bonus box during a round. Say, for example, you took an action cube and the loan in order to take an action but then, as a result of that action, you had enough money to put three coins back in the bonus supply. Even though you have taken the loan this round, you've now repaid it, and so you're free to use the bonus meeple in the traders phase. The same applies if you take an action which gains you one of your extra traders. You could put that straight in the bonus supply, and then take the loan. So, now that we understand how the bonus supply links these phases together, let's take a look at each phase in detail. First is the work phase, and here players will go in turn order, taking one action at a time, by spending one or more action cubes onto one of the four action options. You can take the same action multiple times in the same round. A player who cannot or wishes not to take another action may pass, and once a player has passed, that player cannot take any further actions in this work phase. The first action is to add a new plantation to a co-op. Take the leftmost remaining plantation from any one of your three rows, pay any cost for that plantation, as printed at the top of the row, legally place the plantation on the board, and then gain any benefits for that placement, and based on anything printed under that plantation. The first plantation you place in any given co-op must be a level 1, and must go on the bottom row. Additionally, you must pay one worker from your personal worker pool into that co-op's town centre as part of the cost of the action. You can later build a second level 1 plantation on the bottom row without paying this extra worker cost. To add a plantation to a second row, it must be either a level 1 or a level 2 plantation, as indicated here. You may only place into a space which is connected by path to one of your level 1 plantations and you must move a donkey from your company supply onto the connecting path space. As a bonus, you will gain an advancement on the matching coloured Arabica track, 
indicated by this icon here, and you'll move your token one step up on that track. There are two different ways to build on the top row, which requires either a level 2 or a level 3 plantation. The first, once again, is to place on a space connected by path to one of your second row plantations, and place two donkeys from your company supply onto the connecting path. The other option is to bypass the second row and use a truck from your company's supply, placing it onto the truck space above the plantation. Trucks are quite difficult to come by, and each player can only get two for the whole game. The only restriction on using trucks is that each top row plantation must pair with at least one bottom row plantation. This player could not use another truck to build this. The bonuses for building a top row plantation are, once again, an advancement on the matching Arabica track. And the first two plantations placed there are allowed to take one of the bonus animal tokens shown here, either the wild coloured animal or the animal in the cooperative's colour. Taking any circular token in the game allows you to advance on the matching coloured Arabica track, or on any one track for the wild token, and then place it on the lowest open space of your counter track, or on top of any matching tokens if you already have a token of the same type. After emptying all plantations from the top or bottom row, you have an immediate once-off opportunity to build a farm into any co-op, not just the one where you built the last plantation. You must spend one coin to do this, and then place the farm on a building space showing the farm icon. If it shows this icon, then move up one step on the matching Arabica track. If you don't build the farm right away, then you lose it. Finally, once you've placed all plantations, gain one civet cat from the general supply as a bonus, which, as with every civet cat you gain, is placed straight in Sumatra. The Arabica track, which we've seen several ways of stepping up on, is an important place for gaining points and bonuses through the game. Get all five markers to the second step, and you'll gain one of your extra trader meeples, as well as three points. Get to the third step on all, and you'll gain one of your trucks, and an extra seven points. Each fourth step is worth one coin. The first to reach each fifth step gains a donkey. Each sixth step is worth six points. And the seventh step is worth four points, and can be occupied by only one player. Trucks and donkeys can be difficult to come by, and one way to get around this is to take the breed donkey action, which costs two action cubes. Take a donkey from the general supply, and then place it onto any path space where you could legally place a plantation on a plantation action. In addition to gaining a donkey, you've now reserved this plantation space for only you, and no one can take it, not even with a truck. When you do come to take the place plantation action, you only need to make up the difference in donkeys to the normal amount you'd need. Each plantation needs a worker to produce coffee, and one way you can do that is using action B, the move workers action. Choose a co-op, and then count up the number of players who have at least one unmanned plantation there. Here it's three. Take that many workers from the town centre, and then place one on each player's lowest empty plantation, like so. If your action placed at least one worker on another player's plantation, then move up one space on the matching Arabica track. If there aren't enough workers in the town centre to give one to each player's plantation, then the player taking the action chooses where they go. And if the town centre is ever empty after this action, add one to the town centre from the supply. The final action simply gains you resources, and you can either gain one civet, or two coins. Next is the workers phase, and this is the other way to move workers onto plantations. Firstly, all players may simultaneously move workers from their own worker pool to their own empty plantations. If there are still empty plantations, then in turn order, players have the opportunity to move their own workers onto another player's empty plantation, gaining a step on the matching Arabica track as a reward. Finally, if there are still any unmanned plantations on the board, then the owners of those plantations must pay a penalty. 
This is one, two or three coins depending on the round or one step backwards on any one Arabica track. You cannot step backward from the coin or donkey bonus step or on a track that you haven't started. But any other backward step is valid. If the penalty can't be paid in full, then remove the offending plantation from the board and you must pay for your lower value plantations before your higher ones. Next is the trader and contractor phase, which takes place in turn order. On your turn, you can either pass or you can pay two coins to lead an action. Once you've led an action, each other player in continuing turn order has the opportunity to piggyback that action, taking a weaker version of the same action without paying the coin cost. Both leading and piggybacking require the use of a meeple. Instead of leading, you can choose to pass and you can still take further actions or piggyback actions after having passed in the round. It's only after each player has consecutively passed one lead action that the trader and contractor phase ends. So let's look at the three different actions available. The first action is trade. The leading player pays two coins and then takes one trader meeple and places it on the first trading space in a cooperative that no one has yet traded with this round. The leader takes a stock token and adds it to the warehouse. Now go around the table in turn order and see whether players wish to piggyback or not. The player who piggybacks places a meeple in the next open trading space. A player who doesn't piggyback does nothing. Each trading house has a coin on the space that corresponds to the player count. And if all lower numbered spaces than that are filled, then the player who is not present in that trading house gains that coin, irrespective of whether they passed or didn't have the chance to pass because everyone got in before them. In this way, all four or five players can never be present in the same trading house. This differs from the three player game, where the third player may choose to piggyback as well and join the trading house, or if only two players join the trading house, then the third gains the coin. The next action is to construct a building. To lead this action, you'll pay the two coins and then move one of your meeples into the space currently occupied by one of the top buildings in one of your columns. Then place that building. For anything in these two columns, you'll place it into a cooperative. Choosing an open space which shows the icon of that building and gaining a track advancement if applicable. If it's a warehouse, then you'll move one of your warehouse pieces to any one of the open spaces on your warehouse track. And it doesn't matter which ones you place them on because you can freely rearrange these at any time. Either way, gain the benefit that's printed to the left of the building that you've constructed, which will include some in-game bonuses and end-game victory points. To piggyback the construct action, the player spends no money but must give one coffee to the player who led the action. The player then spends a meeple to construct a building in the same place. This means that if the leading player constructed a warehouse, then the piggybacking player must construct a warehouse. And if the leading player constructed in a cooperative, then the piggybacking player may construct any type of building, not just the same one, into the same cooperative. The final action is to remove a trader and a player may spend two coins and discard a trader entirely from the game to gain any two Arabica track advancements, same track or different. Fourth is the harvest phase and this is where players will gain the coffee they've traded for. Each co-op is resolved individually. Each of a co-op's manned plantations produces two coffee of that color or three in a three player game. The coffee is distributed in three steps. First, each player who has a fair trade post gains one coffee. And note that I'm using the coffee bean shaped player markers here to show you how to count it. In reality, you'll just advance your marker on your warehouse. After the fair trade posts, whoever was first in trading order gains one bonus coffee. Then all remaining coffee is distributed one at a time in trading order, starting from the first player once again. And so the remaining seven coffee here would go red, purple, blue, red, purple, blue, red. 
excluding the bonus coffees for fair trade posts and being first, the most coffee a player can gain is five. So in this instance here, with 14 coffee produced, one bonus would go to yellow, one bonus would go to red, and then the remaining 12 would be distributed, five to red, five to purple, and the other two lost. This is resolved for all five cooperatives. Then, any player who has at least four coffee in storage of all five Arabica types, or at least six in a three-player game, gains one copy Luwak as a bonus. Then each player returns all their civets from Sumatra to the general supply and gains one copy Luwak for each. Then move on to the contracts phase, and this phase takes place in reverse turn order. On your turn, you have four options. You can complete one personal contract on your player board, complete two of the public coffee bar orders, complete one of the public coffee bar orders and pass, or simply pass. Once you've passed, you're out of this phase and you move to the lowest remaining number for the subsequent round's turn order. When completing a contract, whether it be private or public, simply spend the coffee showing on that order by reducing the cubes on your tracks. For coffee bar orders, this will be a single matching type of coffee, which could include coffee luwak. Each of these orders requires six matching coffee, but it doesn't matter which type of coffee it is. When you complete a coffee bar order, cover that order with one of your player markers, immediately gaining the coins, any tokens associated with that order, and some end game points. And in the four or five player game, once you've completed at least one coffee order in each of the six columns, you gain a wild stock counter. When you complete a private contract, discard it from the game and then gain its benefits. This will be the money printed to either the left or right of that contract, any immediate benefits printed in the bottom left, any end game points printed in the bottom right, and if still present, the top Arabica token from the matching lettered contract bonus stack, giving you the Arabica track advancement as usual before placing this on your counter track. Finally, once you've completed both contracts from the same row, you can claim one of the benefits which was placed next to the contracts during setup. This could be an animal token, a civet, or in a four or five player game, a trader contractor meeple. There are only two benefits here in a three player game. You can complete your private contracts in any order. If you don't have the specific coffees you need to complete an order, there are three ways to get them during this phase. You can always spend Copy Luwak as if it is any other Arabica coffee. You can buy an Arabica coffee in rounds one or two for two coins, or for three coins in round three. Or you can trade other coffees for an Arabica coffee in any combination according to your current trade rate, which starts the game at four to one and can reduce to as low as two to one as part of the benefit for building warehouses. You can also exchange three different stock counters to build one warehouse during this phase, or five different stock markers to build two warehouses, perhaps instantly improving your trade value, or benefiting from the bonus coffee that comes with such a build. Some of these trade options can be very expensive, but oftentimes you'll really need the donkeys or trucks or other benefits that come with completing some of these contracts, and so it can be worthwhile in the long run. Last is the refresh phase. Return any black action cubes to your company cubes section or bonus supply, returning your colored cube to the box if you've used it in a four player game. Return any meeples that you use for trading or constructing this round. Now at this point and this point only, discard any coffee which exceeds your warehouse capacity. Warehouses stacked from top to bottom on the right provide one capacity per coffee type, and warehouses stacked at the top provide 10 capacity for that specific coffee. You can freely rearrange these in each refresh phase. So after rearranging like this, I would need to discard one of these coffees to remain within capacity. Next, gain one coffee for each stock token you have in the corresponding type. With a wild, you can choose whichever type you wish. Now, if you took the loan, pay it back from your company supply. 
if you don't have enough money to refill this to three, then take a negative three points token for each coin of shortfall and refill from the general supply. Then refill any coins that were taken from trading houses, move the turn order markers up to the current round and advance to the next round. Through the game, you'll be racing against the other players to complete one or more of the three milestones, which are worth 10, eight or six points for the first, second or third player to achieve them. It does not take an action to claim a milestone, simply place one of your player markers as soon as you meet its prerequisite. The game ends after the third round's refresh phase, and you'll complete final scoring using the game's scorepad. Firstly, evaluate each of the five cooperatives to determine who has added the most value to it, and then you'll score majority points based on that. You'll do this by adding up your total quality points. A plantation has quality points equal to its level, and remember this is the level printed on the plantation, not the row it's positioned in. Each building adds one quality, except for the hospital which adds two. Note as well that a player must have at least one plantation for the buildings to count at all. So here, blue has two, four, five, six, seven. Red has two, three, four. Purple has one, two, three. And yellow has five points worth of buildings, but no plantations for a total of zero. For each co-op, whoever has the most quality gains 16 points, second most gains eight, and third most gains four in a four or five player game. In case of a tie, add the points, split them, and then round them up. Players gain leftover points for resources still in their supply. Three points for a truck, and one point each for a donkey or a worker. Civets gained as bonuses after the last copy Luwak harvest are also worth a point each. Loan default tokens are worth negative three. Next you'll resolve the counter track and you'll gain points equal to the highest covered space on that track, which is a max of 25. Normally you'll have stacks of matching tokens on here, but before you score, you can move some of your duplicates to move higher up on the track. To do this, where you've got any two duplicates of the same color, you can take both of those and then stack them to form a new stack like so. The wild animal matches any other color for this purpose, so these could also be taken and stacked like so. In this way, a failure to diversify on this track doesn't completely stop your progress, but it does slow it down. This player here would gain 20 points. Score points for your final positions on the Arabica tracks, and all of the points here are additive. Red here gets three points for reaching this column, seven points for reaching this column, six points for each of these steps, and four for this one, for a total of 26. Gain points for each completed milestone, and gain points for each completed contract. Gain the points printed under each coffee shop order completed, and evaluate majorities in each of the six coffee shops. Whoever's completed the most orders there gains four points, and second most gains two. If tied, the order closer to the bottom of the page breaks the tie. So in this case here, yellow is first and blue is second. Finally, gain four points if you completed this plantation row and gain the points printed next to every building you constructed in the game. Stock counters aren't worth anything at the end, so do cash them in for warehouses in the last contract phase if you can. The player or players with the highest score wins. The game is designed to be played with three to five players, but there are official two player rules where a third bot player is introduced and it takes its actions according to the information in this book. And that's how to play Coffee Traders. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video, please help us by hitting that like button. Subscribe to us if you haven't already done so. You can also hit the meeple in the corner to do that and hit the bell icon so you'll be one of the first to know when we have new and exciting videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please leave them in the comments section below. See you next time.